All right, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter 23, and we're going to begin reading in verse 8. 2 Samuel, chapter 23, beginning in verse 8. The Bible says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tatmanite that sat in the sea, chief among the captains, the same was, Ad was Adano. The Ezanite, he lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dabu, uh, the, the, Ahonite, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with, with David when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword and the Lord won a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shamna, the son of Agi, the Haranite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop with a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. And he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we have a copy and they can speak to our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this place. We thank you for a group that's gathered once again to be about your word. Lord, we pray that you would uh, draw them, that you would open uh, their eyes, Lord, that we might see the word precious and good, irregardless of what's preached, Lord, that your word is always fine and always precious, Lord. And we pray that you would honor it uh, with the Holy uh, Ghost this day. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we find a number of uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and sometimes I think that we uh, kind of miss the boat, but I want you to see, first of all, we should strive to be mighty men, first of all, and, and that is something that takes effort. Sometimes we want to attribute everything to grace, and then if it doesn't happen, it's God's fault and not our fault. But... God wants effort. He always has been. He always has. That's why some will have five crowns and some will be saved so as fire by fire because they did not put effort in. They did not contribute anything. They did not go about the Father's business. So yes, they're saved. But as the Bible says, saved so as by fire. Now I also want you to see that there is a price for victory. Now... Many say that they want to live in victory, but they don't want to pay the price. And almost we live in a day where we, if you say living in victory, you think of Pentecostal people. But living in victory is a life that any of us can have. Any born again Christian can live in victory or they can stand in defeat. Now, uh, either way, you're saved, yes. Either way, you're going to be with the Lord. But it is a very discouraging thing to live in defeat. In fact, if you do that very long, you'll soon quit and you'll soon give up on the cause of Christ because it'll be so miserable for you just to live on a daily basis. Now, what made these men different? Well, what, what made these uh, separate than everybody else? And you have to come down to this, it was the courage and the work. You know what, it is a courageous thing to stand for Christ in the day that we live. And, and I'm not just talking about the media, and I'm not just talking about the government and all that goes, and those are real things, I, I'm not diminishing them at all. But just to stand for God, even among your own people, it, there's a Christ involved. If you want to live in victory, you're going to look different. If you're going to live in victory, uh, you'll be, I, I would say, easily one out of ten. How, how many people went back and praised the Lord for the healing? One. Right? One out of ten. And, and these men, uh, these three men were very notable. And these, this was uh, in a time where probably... Maybe David's band number 300 
150 maybe. And so now you're down to three individuals. That is less than 1%. That, that is less than 1% that really was committed to serving God. Now he, he begins, these be the names of the mighty men. Now I'll say two things. First of all, yes men, we are held to a, to a, a level of service that women can't be just simply. If nothing else, there have to be silent in the assembly. But ladies, you're not off the hook. It doesn't exclude you. You can be a mighty lady. You can be a mighty woman. What about Deborah? She stood when no one else would, did she not? So this is all inclusive. This is all the Christian people. This is all the born again. We can be satisfied with the mediocre. Or we can be mighty in the faith. And I dare say, we live in a day and age today that most of us, are satisfied with the mediocre. Brother Ashley and I was talking yesterday in Nashville that the problem is this. The world is so demanding there is always, always something to do. Every minute of every day there's some demand on us and you know what? When we live like that the devil sits back and laughs and clicks his heels because he knows you have no time for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, listen, He knows you're saved. He knows you're born again. He knows He can't touch your soul, so why not destroy your life? That's about the best He can do. And you know, He knows it. Everybody says that He kicked His heels and, and glorified the day that Christ died. Oh, no, He didn't. Because His imps were inviting Christ to come down from the cross. Because you know what? If it hadn't happened... He knew when it was over that, that, that the victory had been won. He knew when the Lord Jesus Christ poured out His life's blood that, that the victory was won and there now was a true atonement for sin. His invitation to come down the cross was really to destroy the work of the cross. But praise be to God, the strength of our Savior, He did not come down and He fulfilled that work. And so... We live in a day of defeat, so being mighty is extra hard. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. Now, I want you to see another thing that says the mighty men that he had. It didn't say that's all that he wanted. It didn't say that that's all he appointed. Uh, this was not just an office. It's all that he had. You know what? I want to be something available to the work of Christ. Do you know what? That, that, that's a mighty man. First step in being a mighty man or a mighty woman is yield yourself to the things of Christ. Just make yourself available. If, and this is a great work and we minimize it. If what you have to do is to fall down on your knees for, before God and pray for me as your pastor and pray for this church, that's a great work. That, it, it takes a mighty person to do that. And do it in sincerity. We can all go through the little hymn hall routine, but to do it in to do it in sincerity is quite the other thing. And so that they're set apart. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had or possessed or used. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. Now listen, he wasn't mighty because he was chief. He was chief because he was mighty. Does that make sense? He, he, he first was a mighty servant. He first did the work of battle. And because he did the work of the battle effectively, then he became chief. Uh, we live in a day and age where there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Too many masters and not enough servants. You know what? We ought to well be satisfied to serve Jesus at the lowest point. Remember the parable that he gave uh, of the king's banquet? And he had to ask one of them that was up here to change seats with one that was down here. That's what he's talking about. We, we need a servant's heart today. We need to be in a situation, whatever he has for us, yes, that's what I'll do. That is a mighty man. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had to attack the night that sat in the seat, chief among the captain, captains. The same was Adonai, the Esnite. 
You know, he, he, was, he was specific. You know, it, it's a very remarkable thing. And as we thumb through the pages of this book, can you imagine to be named among God's people? Listen, they estimated, and, and because of the number of the tribe heads and the number of men besides all the women and children, that there was some four and a half million Jews that walked out of Egypt. Listen, this was some time later. They had replicated and replicated large, huge families. And we find his name mentioned. Three men that were called mighty men. Three individuals that, that wanted something different, that wanted something more. Uh, that yielded here themselves to, to a greater cause. These were the men. Ad, uh, know the Esnite, he lift up his spear against 800. Now, I want you to see he didn't, he didn't let what he was keep him from being uh, a mighty man. Anybody ever heard of an Esnite? It didn't say he was a Benjaminite, did it? It didn't say that he was of the tribe of Judah, an Esnite. You know what? That's not even a tribe of God's people. Best I can tell, he wasn't even Jewish. An Esnite. Common, everyday people, just like you and I. A lot of people say, I can't speak. I don't have the courage. Well, listen, if an Esnite can do it, you can do it too. The problem is this, is that we don't want to do it. The problem is this, is that we don't want to put ourselves at risk. And we will find that these three mighty men, they did exactly that. They were constantly in harm's way, and we don't like that. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Now, can you imagine a 1 to 800 ratio that you were the only individual and you will find every three, uh, each of these three mighty men, they were one against many. And we live in a day and age, listen, uh, brothers, sisters, we're one against many. Are there believers out there? You betcha. Are there millions upon millions? I don't think so. Now, in Stewart County, you can't find anybody that's lost anymore. But you can go up and down this road this morning, and including the Lord's true churches, they'll be about this size. See, redemption will bring you to the things of God. True redemption will bring you to the house of God. So the only summation that I can come to is, listen, they're lost. And the only way that you find huge, huge numbers is when they're giving you entertainment, when they're playing rock music and everybody's flopping around and running around like a chicken with their head cut off. When you are of the flesh, yeah, they'll take that. But good old-fashioned Bible preaching, they want nothing to do with it. And people that are saved crave it. And people that are lost don't. People that are lost simply don't. And so we find this individual no different than you and I. The same body set, the same mind, the same muscles, the, the very same way that we're built. In one time killed 800 men standing alone with a single spear. And you know what? I don't think it was anything miraculous. I, in, in, in this sense, I don't think he threw the spear once. And it knocked all 800 of them out. I believe they came at him and he stabbed that one. Then he stabbed this one. And then he stabbed that one. And every eight piece of the 800, every one of those individuals was a, was a little battle in and among themselves. See, so you're not going to get it handed to you and say, what? There it is. It's going to cost you something. And you know what? It's going to be effort involved. Eight hundred people. You know, uh, I dare say, it, 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 that's, that's about a little over eight times what this building will hold, and probably more than that. It was designed to hold a hundred people, but I doubt it would even hold that with the way the pews are. So, killing, killing eight times what this building will hold in 
one day with one spear. See, we have the equipment. Sometimes the devil dukes us out and we don't believe it, but we have that equipment. There's not one person under the sound of my voice this morning that does not have a Bible. What does the Bible of itself say that it is? It says it's a sword. There's your weapon. There's your peace. There's the one you've got. And so we find that this amazing man that was outside the tribe of Judah, that was a Gentile even of himself, that sat now at King David's uh, own table, slew 800 at one time. And after him was Eleazar. Now this is not Eleazar the priest. This is not, this is not in the, the Levite line. This was a different as Eleazar. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dadu, the Ammonite, one of the three mighty men, with David. Now how many of you have heard of the, time, the tribe of Ammonites? You know what? The reason you haven't had it and heard it is because it doesn't exist. He too was a simple Gentile. He had no great lofty office. He had no claim to fame back to the days of Abraham. He was just an everyday Joe. And you know what? If an everyday Joe can do it then, an everyday Joe can do it today. That means you. That means the individual that thinks they have no speaking ability. The individual that thinks he has no courage. The, the lady that thinks that all she can do is just sit around and, and do housework. Listen, those are the individuals that God will use. And after him, Eleazar, the son of Dadu, the, Am, the, oh, the Ahonite, the Ahohite, or the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defiled the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. Two things I want you to see. First of all, David was with him. The enemy was the common enemy, the Philistines. The Philistines was a constant problem to them. And uh, we have a constant problem with us too. And that's the world. We have an ever-present enemy. And you know what? The Philistines were never really defeated. And this world is never really defeated. It's always going to be a hindrance to you. It's always going to be a gouge at your flesh. You're always going to see something else. Hey, you know what? If I took payments on that, I could afford it. You're always going to be that way. You're always going to have... And you know why? Because we're still flesh. We're, we're made of this stuff. Uh, he saved our soul. He didn't, he, didn't save, he didn't save this flesh. And You know, I hear people say, Oh, this flesh is okay. And, and, and some people... Uh, teach a progressive sanctification, meaning that this body will one day be as good as their inward man. The only problem with that is this, is their bodies die just like mine dies. Their bodies get this gray stuff that I have right here just like mine does. If they had a progressive sanctification, why don't they live forever and quit aging? Because that was Adam and Eve's perfect body, was it not? And so we see then that this very regular, routine man, this everyday, run-of-the-mill character, stood with David when no one else would. He stood for the Philistines. And then I want you to see this, this, this is not in here by accident. It says that uh, until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. Now, that's just not holding on to it so you can swing it. His hand was literally locked up on it. Have you ever have you ever hammered so long that you had to do like this kind of to get your fingers off of it? That's what he's talking about. He was weary in body and his hand, he had done it so long his hand was locked and stuck to the sword. Now, that's the type of people that are mighty men and mighty women, people that keep going even when they don't feel like it. That, that's a mighty man 
or a mighty person or a mighty woman who gets up and comes to the house of God when really they don't even feel like crawling out of bed. That's a mighty person, you know what? That's a mighty individual. That's a mighty person that gets up before the chickens and gathers all the stuff together that we even need just to host one of those carnivals we go to and get it all together and be there before they quit letting you drive your truck by the tent and get there and set it up and be ready to roll. That, that's a mighty person. That, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of individual that these three individuals were in the cause of David's wars. They stood out when no one else was. And then notice what it says. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, that, that he worked and the Lord did a great victory. That's one thing is we as Bibles want to leave out. He worked. This man worked. And then the Lord brought a great victory. You know when the Lord wrote a great victory in Dover is when we work. It won't happen before. Could it happen? Sure. That, uh, the Lord God does what He wants to. But what is the more likely of the two? We get out there and do something and God honors it. That's, it, that's, it, that's exactly what occurred here. And then I want you to see, uh, and Israel, so much like Baptist, after this one individual stood with David, wiped out the Philistines, here come everybody else to run in and grab the Philistine stuff and enjoy the spoils of the day, but not willing to enjoy the work of the day. And you see that all the time today. You know what? They want to just, woo-hoo! Uh, man, we're making ground at New Testament. But they don't want to be there. And they don't want to do God's work. And then they wonder why there's no blessing. Mm -hmm. See, we, we need to be a dedicated people. We need to pe be a people that stick to the stuff. Irregardless what happens. This man, huh, if it hadn't been for God... In the normal sense of everything, he would have died. He he was he 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 was one against a whole army, and in man's eyes he would have died, but he stood he stood strong. And after him was Shamna, or Shama, the son of Ag, the Hararite, and the Philistines were gathered together in a troop. And there was a piece of ground full of lentils or beans, and the people fled from the Philistines. Now, how many people, this is the time of year for, you go up uh, in, in larger farming communities, bigger than Dover, where the, the fields are, are much flatter and much larger, and you see the soybeans, they're dried, they're ready to, about ready to come in. But think of that much smaller. Think about Stewart County. Think about your garden. Think about a patch of beans about an acre. Just a little patch of lentils. What would you think of it to defend it? Let them have it. I mean, what are you going to get out of one acre of beans? Maybe, maybe... Maybe 10 bushel, probably half that. What's the point? Right? Are you going you're gonna to give your life for five bushes, bushels of beans? See, that's how we measure things. And, and that's how, how mankind looks at things. And you look about this morning, there's not many of us. But you know, I for one am standing and will defend this patch against whatever. Because it may be small. It may be individual. It may be not that big. But you know what? It belongs to God. God gave His life for it. God gave His dear Son for it. We ought to stand in it and say, Listen, Satan, this is all flimmy. It's, this belongs to God, and I'm going to defend it. Now, when you make that determination, you be sure you're not going to be defended because everybody left him. He stood alone to defend a little patch of beans. And you know what? You will too. You'll stand by yourself sometimes. 
You will be the only one with any kind of genuine interest. You will be the only one that spends the night in prayer. You will be the only one that seeks the face of God. You'll be the only one there. That is the that is the that is the emphasis of the story of these three mighty men. Every one of them at one time or another stood alone against the odds. And you will have to too. And that's not really popular preaching today. But I believe it is what the Bible teaches. That there are very few that want to stick to the stuff. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. And slew the Philistines. And the Lord brought a great victory. Now, this is my own opinion. I don't even think they got one thing. I don't think they transferred one thing in the ground because God was with him. That belonged to God. That was his. And we find a man that would, would pay the price of victory. That put himself at risk irregardless whatever, anything, anything else that might happen, he was willing to do it. Look at me in the book of 1 Chronicles just a little further over. Uh, 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29, and we'll begin reading in verse 9. 1 Chronicles 29, beginning in verse 9. The Bible says, Then the people rejoiced, for they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly unto the Lord. Now, uh, they are fixing to, to set aside some some money and some things, some gold and some silver and some items that they needed to build the temple. Now the temple constructions were years off. See, David wasn't allowed to build the temple because he had blood on his hands. He was a warrior. And he knew going in and setting all these pieces aside that he would never even see it. What about you? You willing to lay this aside for things you full well know you will never see. And see, David wasn't the only one. There were men and women, ladies, that were given all they had that knew they would never even see the temple in existence. And there should be people among us, if we're dedicated to be mighty men, and we're dedicated to be mighty women, that knows we may never even see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we may never even see this church grow even by one member. That we may never see by our own mouth and concern for another, never ever see one more soul saved. But give it everything you've got. See, that was the type of people. And now we're not talking about the three mighty men of David. We're talking about the whole nation. We're talking about every individual that, that made up the difference. We're talking about all those that, that were involved in Israel at that time. They all gave willingly to the Lord. Now, I also want you to see that they also did this with a perfect or complete heart. And they were all in unison on it. Man, that's a rare gift for a church, isn't it? You have this faction over here that gets mad at this faction. That, and you know what? Listen, we're supposed to believe the same thing. We're supposed to stand for the same truths. And you know, you get this one over here. You know what? That'll rip a church apart. And you need to stick to the stuff. Now, if that happens, do you need to run off and tuck tail and leave? No, fight for your ground. You fight for that little patch of lentils. Just, and, and you know what? If the opposition leaves, close the door on your way out. Right? Little patch of lentils. We need to defend it. We, we need to uh, consider it precious. Notice in verse the rest of verse 9, and David the king also rejoiced with great, joy, with great joy, wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Now, now get the real scene here because he's getting everything. He's dedicating all these materials and still saying, Woo, boo hoo, I will never get to see it, Bill. I really wish that I could see it, Bill. Instead, he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've seen the lumber piles. Uh, I've seen I've seen the gold being stacked 
stepped away. I've seen the silver being made ready. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, we're not satisfied for seeing the lumber stacked, are we? We want to see this and see that. You know what? You may not live to see it. But stack your lumber. Make things ready. You know what? You're going to get out of this meeting that starts tomorrow night exactly what you put into it. And if you didn't put nothing into it, you know what? Friday night you go home with nothing. Don't, don't blame Brother Cummings and don't worry, Brother Ross, because they're not the issue. And so then we see that we should be rejoicing in the fact even to have the opportunity to participate and to give. To, to contribute and to, to give to His name. Verse 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory. Now notice what David says in his prayer of praise. He says, Thine is the victory. You know what? If the Lord God does something at New Testament, thine is the victory. If souls are saved, thine is the victory. If people are, are added to the church, thine is the victory. Thine is the victory. Thine is the victory. We don't bring it on in of ourselves. We don't pull it together. But we do stand in the mark. We do what we can do. But thine is the victory. You know what? <laughs> David was a, a mighty, mighty warrior. And he accomplished a great deal for the cause of the Lord. But he gave the credit to the Lord God. As we should. 1 John. I will read 1 John. We, we've seen this. Most, of, most people probably doesn't even know that it's in the Bible. But we've seen it here a whole lot. First John, if I remember correctly, it's been so long ago now, Sister Millie brought this song to our attention. First John chapter 5, first John, excuse me, yes, chapter 5 verse 4, first John chapter 5 verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith faith is the victory that's the title of that song right so if we want to live victorious like these three mighty men of old you've got to have some measure of faith now again i always point out that it doesn't say the faith meaning the oracles and truths handed down to god from god to his people it says faith which means believing confidence now do you believe with confidence that the lord could grow new testament church do you believe with confidence that tomorrow night starts revival here that it goes beyond the meeting that revival will begin. Do you believe with confidence that you'll make it home all right? You know what I have seen? We believe in confidence with the physical, but not with the spiritual. When you sat down on this pew this evening, you believed that it would hold you up, did you not? These are good, nice, solid oak pews. Strong, probably be here when I'm gone. Why can't you have that kind of confidence in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? I will never leave him or forsake you. <clears throat> but old Elijah thought, <laughs> thought he was it at the end, didn't he? Or when he was up on the hill. He came back down and did great things for the Lord. But he got in that situation, did he not? You know why? He lacked faith. He lacked, he lacked confidence in the ability of God. So if you want victory, have full faith, have full confidence, have, have full believing faith that God will do as He's promised to do. Go with me to the Philippians. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, the Bible says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss 
for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now, again, if you want to if you want to experience the victory and you want to live in victory, there are some things that you're going to have to prioritize as loss. Now, remember who Paul was before his conversion. Remember that that he was a Jew among Jews. He, he, he gave his lineage in many places to show, listen, I know what I'm talking about. He spoke five languages fluently. He, he, he knew the Roman law as well as the Jewish law. And that's the way he was able to defend himself even against Pontius Pilate. And, and so I want you to see that he was no dummy. But he counted that knowledge nothing as of the knowledge of Christ. Now, what do you count this world to be? Something great or something minor? You know what? I don't have much. But my salvation and my knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is much, much more precious to me than what little bit I do have. And, and we need to get to that point. We need to count the cost. We need to know that what... Just the knowledge of who he is is far more important than what we could ever accumulate here. And, and, and so we see then that Paul understanding this probably far better than we will ever will. Because he gave up a great deal more than we ever will. He says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them as dumb, but that I may win Christ. Now, he was interested in in victory and he knew that by what he knew to give up so victory victory definitely has a cause d d victory has a place um, look at me in the gospel of Matthew and we're going we're gonna to finish up Matthew chapter 10 the Lord Jesus Christ makes it much more clear than I ever could Matthew chapter 10 and verse 39 Matthew chapter 10 and verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. That's everything. That's living in victory. When you think of me, what do you think of? Some of you have lots of ideas. Some I'm your pastor. Some may, may pop into the first of your mind. Well, Larry is a decent nurse. I don't know. Some may say, he's my son-in-law. He's my father-in-law. He's my granddaddy. He's my daddy. Those titles and all that goes with it, precious as they may be, is not as important as your relationship with Christ. He counted them as dumb. His home. You know, have you ever thought about it? And we read so much of the Bible and just skim over it and okay. Uh, the Lord said to himself, The Son of Man have not even where to lay his head. And you know what? I don't think he had regrets about that. He wasn't saying it to play his little fiddle. He was saying, This is what you need to do. That, that this is your situation. He wasn't playing a boo-hoo hop shop. He was giving us an example. He was saying, there's where you should be. So if you want to be victorious today, get your priorities set. And once you get them set with the Word of God and with prayer, you stay with them. You stick to the stuff. And you know what? I will fully guarantee this. They will be tested. Because they were tested for these three men, were they not? You ever look down the end of a sword at 8,000 people? 8,000 enemies of God. And you say, whew, thank God, no. Well, I do also know this. That Elisha prayed for the boy. He said, Lord God, open his eyes. And they hills were filled with their defense. But have you ever wondered if you could pray and say, Lord, open my eyes completely. 
and you see the imps of hell that's sitting about us and opposing the things of God. If you think they're not real, you don't know your Bible. It was no small thing when the Word of God said that a third of the angels were cast into the earth. <coughs> That's no small thing. Again and again, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry, especially in Matthew's account of the gospel, and he cast out devils. And he cast out devils. And he cast out devils. Where do you think those devils are? The legion of devils. What was their request? They were under the authority of Christ and they knew it. Their request was, don't make us be just cast out. What about the man that had the clean and shiny house, which means this flesh? And the demon said, you know what? I'm going to go get seven more evil than myself. And we're going to house up here again. Where do you think those came from? You think it's just a story? You think it's just a myth? Listen, those things are real. Mm -hmm. Their opposition to us, even today, no game we're playing. I want to live in victory, don't you? Ah, victory has cost, but I want to live in victory. I want to be more than mediocre. I want to be more than everyday routine. I want to be. A person that lives in victory. And you know what? The greatest, most wonderful gift of victory. It's not that you can say that you stomped down devils because you didn't do it. Christ did. It's that you could be happy. That's the greatest benefit of it. Yeah. That you could have joy. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith. You want, do you want those spiritual fruits? Living big. Well, Junior, you come. Mm -hmm. so